Hello and welcome to the Remote Work Movement Podcast. I am your host Gonzalo All, and today's guest is Mitch Turk, a transportation innovation specialist who is making a ruckus by investing his time and resources to change the legislation of the US in order to include remote work. We talked a lot about remote work, how it can help people with disabilities, people in rural areas be more integrated in the global drummer market, but also the impact that remote work can have in the climate crisis that we have right now. We learn everything about port, the proof of required travel, and why it's so important to legislate in the US and in the whole world about remote work. It was a very interesting discussion on the whole impact of remote work and how the country should approach the legal side of the remote work in order to facilitate the development and increase the employment of sensible groups of people. Please enjoy my conversation with the great and much fun Mitch Turk. Mitch, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Gonzalo. Tell me one thing. I was looking into your LinkedIn account and I was very curious about your current position. What does a transportation innovation evangelist do? <laughs> uh, it means that I, I go around pontificating about how we should change the way we get around our, our cities and our world for a uh, kind of holistic benefit. And that's, uh, that is in part why you and I are talking today, because one of those solutions is working remotely. Ah, exactly. That's true. You just give me everything now. So, you know, we are both uh, remote work apologists and we are really talking about it everywhere and as much as we can. But in your opinion, what is the biggest impact that remote, remote work can have in people's lives? So on the people's side, what is the biggest impact that we can actually have if everybody started working remotely today? Uh, I, it's hard to pick one thing because there's, there's so many advantages. Um, I mean, I, I guess I would say it depends on what you care about the most. If you care about, you know, the climate, then it is one of probably one of the greatest things we could do for that sake that no one is talking about. Um, if you care about your your cities, building better cities and and ways to live in communities, um, then it's super transformational from that standpoint. And you know, in fact, a lot of a lot of the places where we live. Uh, we're built around where the jobs were and we have to rethink how that works. And then there's just the, you know, from a personal health and wellness standpoint, if, if all you care about is, you know, you and your family, then that's cool. You're going to have more money in the bank. You're going to have more free time, you know, more flexibility uh, on a level that most people don't really have until they retire. So it's, it's huge in that way. Yeah, definitely. And you touch a point that I'm really into right now, which is the distribution of the population and where actually people live. Most of the people right now live in the cities because the jobs are in the cities, right? Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Do you see the cities shrink if remote work is implemented widely? Uh, do you think people will return to the smaller cities where they can have more quality of life? Or are they too connected to the cities right now and they just want to stay in the cities because of the services, the theaters, etc. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually one of probably, I think the most interesting and challenging question around uh, mass telecommuting or systemic telecommuting as it relates to building our cities is that it, it it's a, it's a tool that allows you to be more effective in whatever your goal is. So if your goal is to live on a farm, way way out from a city then obviously this makes it a lot easier uh from a from a job opportunity standpoint if your goal is to build dense cities uh this is this can also be useful so i, I think it to me it's kind of the foundation of what we should be doing in order to prepare ourselves to make other movements in in policy and innovation to get wherever we want to go so if a group of people in some region want to live further apart and uh, th think they can do so sustainably, then remote work will work great for them. But on the other hand, and, and I guess I should also mention, right, and you've had some guests on here already, you talk about that they're working on solving for the rural brain drain, which in America is a, is a big problem, right? So you get this, this really strengthens the opportunity for those rural communities to build themselves up and become self-sustaining. So it's, it's awesome from that standpoint. But on the other side of the fence, You know, you've got in cities a, a ton of buildings, you know, 30, 40, 50 plus story buildings that are vacant 
for most of the day. And if we can reuse those spaces, uh, and obviously also the, the, the parking infrastructure that supports all of them for eight hours a day, if we can reuse all of that and make it in a, in a more usable space, then we can get mixed use housing and get affordable housing. We can get uh, all kinds of great stuff that goes on in those cities. And we're, those places are already built to be attractive uh, from a transit and accessibility standpoint. So uh, you can actually bolster either side of the uh, of the argument with remote work. Yeah, definitely. And we have the case of Shelly Fosse back in New Mexico where she's doing a really great job in reintegrating people through remote work. So yeah. previous miners that right now are just being reintegrated, re-educated to remote work uh, through her job in Chibola. Uh, Chibola Cello Works. And yeah, it's amazing what you can do with just a small education and the right mindset. And what's in it for the company? So we know the side of the people, but companies still think that most... Remote work is just a, a perk for their employees and a way to get people around the companies. What do you think the companies have to win with remote work? Uh, I mean, first off, the, you know, many studies have shown that companies are, and this should be obvious, right? Companies incur an immediate financial benefit or near immediate financial benefit from doing this and the you know, facilities costs and all the other kinds of stuff. Um, I think the number that usually gets floated around is that it's somewhere around 10K per employee per year that you save if you have them working remotely. Um, it also obviously expands the job pool so they can grab talent from wherever they want to do it, which is also a cost savings mechanism, which, which I've, you know, utilized often in my, um, in my roles, because, you know, when you're working remotely or living out of a van or whatever, you don't need a lot of money. And so, uh, you know, I look like a more attractive candidate to say someone in New York or San Francisco who is hiring and says, you know, can you do this job for, X amount of money. And I say, I could actually do it for like two thirds of that because I don't really need that much money because I don't live where your job is. And so in that sense, you're expanding the talent pool. Uh, and then also, I don't know that I've really seen a study. I guess I've seen a few, but you know, for the most part, the vast majority of studies show that your workers are going to be more loyal, more satisfied and uh, more determined to do their job, which, uh, you know, seems like exactly what you'd want to be doing. Yeah, definitely. And uh, nowadays there was a study that saying that the millennials will change their jobs at least 30 times during the, the work life. <laughs> uh, so 30 times. And this is because we can just change to the job that is next to it, to the best company, or to the hottest scene. Right. Uh, but if a company offers remote work, we don't have actually to do that because we'll be more loyal. Specific right now that we are just in the beginning, we can be much more loyal to one company if they offer us the right setup and it can be really happy there, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the things I say too, which is, I, I, um, you know, it, it's my own uh, soapbox, but I, I think it stands true in my experience is you're going to get, corporations are going to get management styles and uh, structures that are more improved when you have to manage remote people. And so you're going to get a better uh, operation and better operational efficiency and you're going to get better performance out of your employees and to your point then you're going to get them more uh engaged in a way that this you don't reward just with money which once you get past a certain threshold there's kind of like this uh our general argument of like 75k a year or something but once you get past a certain threshold of salary and compensation it's difficult to incentivize employees further so if you're building a better culture and a better operational structure then you're going to be able to, to incentivize them in ways that goes, you know, well beyond the ceiling of paying them more money. Yeah, definitely. This, this, in the same study, I read that this, this generation is also more motivated by the meaning and by work-life balance. Yeah. Actually, more than 59% when asked this question, what do you value more in your job? Always more than 50% answered work-life balance as number one. And there is no better way to offer work-life balance as being able to work wherever you happen to be, it may be in a small village or in the big city, but just having the freedom to choose it, right? Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, that's uh, right. I remember seeing that study too. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. It's a trend that you know any any employer should be looking at. Um, and then you know, and you can also take information. I think uh, Owl Labs just put out a recent study that kind of hits on this point that's been touched on many times before, which is that. There's a large percentage of people who work remotely who nominate them, 
themselves to take a pay cut in order to do so. So that that's just proof positive right there, right? That someone's willing to work for less money in order to get, you know, what they think is more valuable, which is kind of preposterous considering they're probably better employees for it. But, you know, that's, that's that. Yeah. And you, in, yeah, with the cost of hiring and everything else, it makes much more sense to try to make your employees happier and keep them around for more time than just keep hiring. It's so expensive to hire nowadays. There's a shortage of talent in the big cities and yeah, it's just easier to offer them something that will actually improve your company. That's remote work. Yeah. Do you have any vision for what would be like the perfect company in your vision? Uh, I have mine and I'm very curious to, to know yours. <laughs> Perfect company. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, well, first of all, a company that understands the concept that, you know, the executives work for the employees and the employees work for the customers. So a facilitating leadership style rather than an authoritative one, I think is, is important. And that's where, uh, we miss out on a lot of that when we have this, uh, this kind of vertical structure that you have when you work in an office and a sense of like, okay, my boss is breathing down my neck or they're behind me or whatever the case is. And you just kind of perpetuate this idea that like you work for someone in this company and you do what they say, um, which is not really the way it should be. You, I mean, it's not so you shouldn't do what they say, but you know, they should be more incentivized to be making sure you're successful. Uh, which again, you really have to, you kind of have to force that um, when you're managing people who you can't just, you know, stand behind. So in that sense, I think, uh, you know, for the most part, I think teams should work remotely uh, whenever possible. There are certainly times, uh, there's certain types of folks and certain types of roles that can rarely work remotely. Uh, and there are also just good times when you want to get together with folks and, and, you know, be present with each other. So in that sense, some flexibility around um, actually getting folks together in, in ways that are more like retreats or gatherings or, uh, you know, things of that nature um, that are happening maybe once a week or once a month, depending on how you're structured. Um, but in that sense, I think, you know, primarily running remote and then having folks kind of gather as, uh, as they see fit. And then just, you know, more important than maybe all of that is just constant feedback loops. So just make sure everyone is, is cool with what's going on. And then if they're not, address it and repair it. So I have a big question regarding companies for you, not sure your opinion, but I'm really curious. Do you think that the companies should and can hire worldwide and focus more on the synchronous communication? Or do you, do you prefer synchronous communication and teams closer together in the time zone? Uh, I, I mean, you know, I'm a bit biased personally because I do a lot of the work I do is strategic or creative. And so uh, I need a lot of asynchronous time, but I, I adore asynchronous working. I try to do it whenever I can. I say no to as many meetings as possible. Um, and I recommend everyone, <laughs> everyone else does as well. But, oh, uh, yes. <laughs> but you know, there, there are times when, you know, synchronous work has, has value that at least so far we have found a hard time uh, replicating by working asynchronous, asynchronously. I mean, we're humans and so we innovate. And so we will work on that and tools will get better. But for now, there's, you know, some components that still, really re rely on that kind of uh work style but i mean i'm i'm all about working asynchronously and i think it is uh it's at the crux of you know one of these concepts around why people don't trust remote work and they should be thinking the opposite way yeah definitely and there's also the communication side um, because we were built to work asynchronous in the way that we have done it for the last centuries uh, it's still very hard to make a manager and to make him understand that, no, we can actually work if one person is in Bali, the other one is in the US and the other one is in, uh, in Europe. Just the uh, answering times and the feedback times will be a little bit higher. But actually what ha which, that is happening, and I see that every day, is that we ask less questions when we work asynchronously. So yeah. therefore we go, we have less interruptions. Because, because we know that the rest of the team is not uh, working at the same time or they will not answer right away, we will think twice and try more to solve the issues by ourselves and we'll take more ownership instead of just asking questions to the other people and keep interrupting them, which is a big issue. Huge, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I hate interruptions. I'm being interrupted all the time. I have to drop social media, man. It's, it's <laughs> wild. <laughs> How do you think, like we are right now in the tipping point where most of the companies is trying to approach remote work in the way on the other. What is your opinion about the one day remote work a week? Uh, I mean, any, any movement is good, 
in that direction because it's like anything else where I think, you know, if people are not exposed to something, they have their opinions, their fears, their, their, you know, fantasies about what it's actually like. All you have to do is really expose people to something and you start to get an understanding of how practical it is. So one day is great. Um, you know, two days is great. I think once you start there, it's, you've kind of pierced the veil of ignorance around that. Um, it can start to become more obvious. So if, if that's what companies need to do, then that's fine. I think, you know, whatever steps that they're comfortable taking, uh, as a starting point, yeah, right? as a starting like point, starting slowly, even to test out, see the, the communication systems, if everything is properly set up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Cause I mean, I, I mean, and I have total faith that as you do that, maybe not at the pace you should, but as you do that, you will end up doing more of it. I mean, it's, I have not come across a company that I've spoken with yet who said, you know, we've tried this in mass or, you know, in any kind of uh, scale and decided to scale it back because it was, you know, bad things happened. I mean, sometimes bad things happen, but that's, you know, as with anything, bad things happen. But yeah, I think it's, you know, it's, it's important. It's, there's kind of just this first step you have to get over, which is like, acknowledging that if you were in a, a knowledge worker job or a white collar job, most white collar jobs, the majority of the work that you're doing is virtual. And the fact that you happen to be doing it in an office with a bunch of other people around is just kind of a, a preposterously bad way of doing virtual work. Yeah, definitely. We go to the offices to work in our computers and it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So now we come into a little bit more of what you're doing right now. And the first question is very, very general, but how can we make remote work the new mainstream? Uh, what measures can we take to make sure that all the companies uh, see this uh, opportunity? Because it is an opportunity. Uh, so what steps do you think we as promoters of this movement, but also everyone else involved because there's more and more uh, people involved, how can we all together make it mainstream, basically make it available to everyone who wants to work remotely? Yeah. Um, I mean, first off, I want to say if you're doing anything in this space to, to forward the idea of it, then you're doing a, a good job. You're, you're at least doing something. Um, because again, we go back to that idea of, you know, unfamiliarity breeds, breeds fear um, and distrust, right? So the more you can be talking to people about it, the more you can be answering the you know one question on the top of their mind, the more you're breaking down that that stigma about what this isn't. Um, so in that way, any discussion about it, a podcast like this, uh, a conference per se, which maybe you you know something about a conference that might be coming up. Yes, both. <laughs> yeah, no, I just uh, just finished organized the conference this weekend. We had three hundred people in Lisbon. Yeah, mostly Portuguese. Yeah, it was crazy. We brought people from all over the world. It was so cool. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, stuff to that effect is all great. Uh, you know, at some point, right. You want to be worried that you're preaching to the choir and you need to expand into places that where you're going to get more confrontation. And that's where you, that's where you get into stuff. Like, I think it's, it's great for folks who are advocates of remote work to be talking to, um, like green building alliances and, and public land trusts and anyone who's talking about land use, anyone who's talking about transportation because it is uh, kind of comically not a thing that these groups talk about. It's kind of like, you know, you, you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So if you work in transportation, you're thinking about like, how do things with wheels solve our problems? Um, and you don't really think about the fact that the best way to get from A to B is for A and B to be the same place. So in that sense, uh, I think as we expand into other realms of problem solving, and we can just roll in and say, hey, guys, you know, like telecommuting systemically is a solution for the problem you're talking about. Um, the more it can start to get this this groundswell of uh, support around being a, a, a holistic solution for cities and for employers. Definitely. And why is remote work not a team for a team for event, environmentalists? Because I was thinking. This is huge. Remote work can actually change the world. We can commute less. Everything is better in that terms. Can you see uh, the environmental institutions being a key to help uh, promote remote work in the future as a way to save the planet? I mean, without a doubt. It's, I mean, it's something that should be top of mind for them. 
Yeah, but it's not happening, right? This, I never. Uh, I know it's. <laughs> well, this is where this is where we get into the thing that uh, that's gotten me on this podcast, and we'll we'll get into that in a second. I think, but yes. it, you know, it's just it's a it's an archaic mentality, and you get a lot of. Uh, I mean, I, I I'll speak to this from the transportation sector, which is uh, in in a lot of ways the people who are working on that stuff are concerned about the environment, and so you know it plays into that. Um, I mean, first of all, transportation is is America's biggest contributor of of emissions, and passenger cars are the biggest contributor to transportation, and commuting is the biggest contributor to car travel. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, really, it's just that they they have an archaic mentality about work that kind of leads to the same stig- kind of like a cognitive dissonance where the things that they would tell you if you were like, oh, I love my car, I love driving my car on the highway and being inefficient, the things they would tell you to solve that problem and why you should be concerned are basically the same arguments I'm making to them about why you should accept remote work. And they defend themselves, ironically, in the same way that someone with a car defends themselves. They say like, oh, well, I mean, but this is what we always do. And it's like super convenient. I don't want to be inconvenienced. Or like, what if X, Y, Z weird thing happens? It's like it, the same arguments that they're fighting against on one side, they're supporting when you ask them about, you know, the idea of telecommuting. So that's, it's just a stigma, really. Yeah, indeed. I think we need to work more with the environmental, environmentalists to, to make it happen quicker. I, I heard a really cool quote in, at Running Remote. I shared it before, but it's, uh, remote work is better than being vegan for the environment. This is super yeah. controversial, but we don't we don't need to get into that discussion. <laughs> yeah, <But> yeah. <laughs> it really shows uh, how big uh, remote work and working from home, or working from close to your home, uh, how big an impact can it have in the at the environment in general? Yeah, and yeah, and obviously, right? You can always uh, you can trace you know energy use and everything back to its source and, and make arguments you know in those cases for any side. And I'm not going to sit there and, and make an argument to say like, oh, it's better than this or better than that. But, you know, it is worth noting, I think, for people who do get it, um, but they will, they will often kind of take up arms against folks who are like, you know, running around with a, a picket sign that says like, go vegan or something like this, or whatever the case may be, um, and say, uh, how about like, don't travel all over the world and don't go to your job that's, you know, 30 miles away in a car. And that actually would be huge, uh, but you're not doing that. So there's a lot of the uh, there's a lot of hypocrisy in that, which I should point out. Maybe made a, a couple enemies just now on on your podcast because I know a lot of remote workers love to travel, and we should acknowledge that is that is a that is a guilty pleasure. <laughs> that is uh, that is something that is not good from an environmental standpoint. Um, I'm I'm as guilty of it as anyone, so I'm not uh, judging folks. I'm just saying, uh, you know, that is a reality of remote work. Is that if you're doing it from a from, a, from an environmental awareness standpoint, then um, you should just, you know, stay in uh, the rural outskirts of, uh, you know, Iowa or something like that. There is definitely a lot we can do about transportation. And yeah, I'm a digital nomad, so I travel a little bit, although not as much as people think. We travel every two, mo- every two months, more or less. So it's not, it's not like I travel every single day to do, to do work and I don't have a car. So yeah, let's make it more or less even. But the <laughs> truth is, I see people, when I arrived to Europe a couple of months ago, I saw a lot of people that are traveling for a meeting or are traveling just for one day from Berlin to Lisbon, have a meeting and go back. And the meeting that could be done through video conferencing, we have amazing tools right now, we are using them right now. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, the little things we could do about the transportation. Do you have any other ideas? And I know you are working on it, so you do have a lot more ideas about how we can uh, improve our transportation and how we can actually make a bigger impact uh, with transportation and remote work together to make our world a little bit better at least? Yeah, I mean, so there's virtual tools and as you were just mentioning, right? And I think that's that's kind of the, the thing that folks um, naturally fail to acknowledge. They do this in, in all realms of life, right? But you, you look at, um, I forget which bias that's called, conservatism bias maybe, or sunk cost maybe, which, uh, hard to say which one. But you look at the world that you're in now and you, and you think, well, this is how it works now. If I change, there will be issues that I, that I need to overcome. But you're not acknowledging that like the world you're in now overcame 
crap ton of issues over the past centuries to get to where it was. So like acknowledging that remote workers are more, you know, statistically more successful and more happy in environments that aren't even conducive to it right now is, is crazy to think about, right? Because if we actually just all started focusing on working remotely, you'd have companies coming out of the woodwork with innovations, you know, and say like, okay, now we've got a hologram of Gonzalo in, in my, currently my bedroom, which would be awkward, but you know, we could have stuff <laughs> like that. Right. And it's like, you know, there's so many things we could be doing if there was funding and uh, demand going towards it, which there is increasingly, but you know, we're still in the infancy of solving for this kind of stuff. Um, which is why folks think it's justifiable to like hop on a plane to go see, to go see a client. Um, it's also of course subsidized and making, making it more acceptable to do that. So if you priced it correctly, they, they would all of a sudden think twice about it, but that's neither here nor there. On the good side, there is definitely more tools than ever and more and more companies focusing on distributed teams as they see it's the future. Like almost every day I have a new tool on my LinkedIn inbox. Uh, so yeah, it's happening. It's just starting. And if it's like this already regarding the tools, I imagine in one year, uh, <laughs> that will be a fun part. But the truth is, even the holograms, it's being built. There is a company already building it, not widely accepted yet as almost all new technologies, but it's happening. It's not the future. Again, this is the present. We can, this is happening already. We can act right now. We are not talking even about the future of work. We are just talking about how to make it faster and more accessible to everyone. And of course, transportation is a huge, huge issue that you are trying to tackle. Uh, but this, this is also good for people, for example, with disabilities, right? Uh, this can include a lot of people uh, on the job market that right now don't have any, any opportunities. Yeah, that's uh, so disability, people on disability, people with disabilities, people, I shouldn't say people on disability, but people with disabilities, um, the growing, at least in America, the aging, you know, boomer population, this is a, a larger uh, percentage of the population than it than it typically was as far as relates to people who need to actually work because uh, social security isn't doing the job that it used to. So you've got a lot more folks who are needing either, a, you know, some kind of gig economy or, or, or side gig or whatever you want to think about, or even a full-time job who normally would have been retired. And these folks may not qualify as necessarily disabled, but they are probably, you know, borderline in that it may be inconvenient for them to commute to and work in the office that you've, the, the physical structure that you built for them. So, you know, in that way, again, you're kind of future proofing yourself as a, as a corporation to say like, yeah, we'll make the accommodation of you working from home, which helps both of us, which is, and to your point, the accommodation of being able to telecommute is often the, the solution that a company will provide to someone who um, is protected under the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act. So that's, you know, that's a viable accommodation to say like, I I am not capable of working in your office because you don't have a ramp or you require, you know, stairs or whatever the case is, but I am capable of doing your job. So that act basically from a civil rights standpoint says you need to solve for this person as long as it doesn't, you know, create a huge uh, financial problem for you to do so. Um, and so usually the route they go is to say like, well, you can just telecommute. And so in that, in that way, it's, it's really a boon to, to folks, the increasing number of folks in that, space definitely how inclusive will, will we be if we do that right uh, how many how much more people instead of depending from social security could actually have a normal job and learn skills like everyone else yeah because simply they don't have to move to the office and that's a huge game changer exactly what about the access for people in remote areas uh, i'm not sure if you saw a video i will guess so about fahim uh, a kid that works from uh, Bangladesh and is actually uh, winning money for the family. I'll put in the show notes. Have you seen that video, Mitch? Uh, I think I came across it, yeah. So it's a kid, uh, not like it has the same disease as Stephen Hawking had. I will, yeah. not, I will not try to guess the name, but yeah, it's uh, basically he cannot move, super smart kid. Uh, He's in the wheelchair and he's in the middle of Bangladesh in a very poor area. So it just happens that he found more about, about uh, 
freelancing. So he learned web designing and he learned uh, designing uh, by himself in the computer. And he now provides design services. I checked this weekend because I included the video in my talk. And he has more than 200 five-star reviews <laughs> in his designs. And the guy's winning good money, not for only for him, but for the family. And the, the impact that economically he has in the community is really, really huge. How much more equal equality can we have in the world if we all work remotely, right? What is your opinion about that? Could we improve Africa situation, even South America and uh, poor, con poor country situation or Southeast Asia? Can remote work uh, make the world more equal in a way that uh, the economy and the capitalism by themselves were not able to do so? Yeah. I mean, for sure, right? If you think about, you know, say you are a underdeveloped or slowly developing nation or region, um, say it's Africa, South America, anywhere around there, and you have the option of building highways and uh, all kinds of infrastructure to solve for people getting to jobs that you hope will develop as you build out this infrastructure, or you have the option of, building a uh, high speed internet that is useful obviously outside of the realm of just people you know working but you know which one of those is more sustainable and easier to build out and easier to get funding for obviously and you know which one of those allows people to be part of a global workforce and and get their talent out there i mean this solution seems obvious and to that extent i think that you know um Fahim's case is is a perfect example of it We've seen that not only in some of those developing areas, but you know, even in the early days of rem of remote work, that was kind of the whole impetus for it. Uh, before it became kind of an environmental movement, and the guy from uh, was a, some engineer from NASA who like f officially proposed it as like a solution to the oil crisis in America. But before that, um, I think as far back as I know, the the mother of remote work. Is this woman, uh, Dame Stephanie Shirley, and she was from the UK, if I remember correctly. And uh, basically, she was, you know, sick of fighting discrimination as an engineer, a woman engineer, um, in the 50s and 60s. And she just started this group of of women, moms, folks like that, you know, people who we normally 20, 30 years ago would have thought, you know, these people can't do these jobs, and just like said, I'm going to put, a, you know, a, a veil over the all of the stigmas around us, so that I'm, so that we're protected. And I'm going to create this remote working company that basically provides these engineering solutions to, you know, manufacturers and government and things like that. And she even signed her name as Steve. She started calling herself Steve in letters and, and things of that nature to, to give off this idea of like, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm just a dude like you, blah, blah, blah. We're just doing engineering stuff. <laughs> but it was all women doing this stuff. So, but it was, they were all protected behind this, this uh, structure that basically said like, yeah, you don't worry about how you know who we are or where we come from whatever like judge us on the quality of our product and and that worked out great for us so um yeah so it you know remote work has its roots in that kind of thing and so it only makes sense as you globalize the economy that that kind of stuff perpetuates so I, yeah i think it's huge for that definitely and as the internet is moving slower to be to becoming a international right, a human right, almost as the internet will be the access for everyone to jobs, etc. Will do you see the remote work going in the same direction? Meaning, remote work being treated as normal and then like a mandatory thing for most of the companies and people? Uh, I mean, I certainly think it'll it'll grow at a similar rate. Um, the adoption of it and the market advantage of it on you know all sides is kind of obvious um I, I you know i wonder if it'll grow in a way that that be, that kind of moves alongside like the human right and and things of that nature um because you know there's still folks who are going to fight that but i think it'll take a while but it's going to generally move in that direction productivity and and work being performed is obviously moving in the direction of being virtualized and digitized and so it all makes a lot of sense but then again you know a lot of things made sense that ended up taking 50 or 100 years to to achieve just because of uh you know humans mental laziness so it's hard to say 
Yes, and money. There's always money involved. Yeah, that too. Uh, the change of mentalities cost a lot of time. One good thing that they told me, a person, HR manager from a very big company, international company, told me is that they are starting to implement remote work because of money. They are seeing that they, are, they cannot hire the best people. They are not hiring at a fast rate enough to grow. So they are thinking about starting to implement remote work. That's, um, that's actually, so the, the largest, uh, as I'm sure you know and your listeners know, but um, the largest employer of telecommuters in the U.S. is the U.S. government. And uh, in large part, they did this because they didn't want to figure out how they were going to afford buying up real estate and affording real estate for all of these employees. And so it's a cost saving measure in that sense. So yeah, again, and even that act particularly states, you know, it, it kind of makes an acknowledgement there that says, um, it's, it's called the telework enhancement act of 2010. And it basically says you should try to work remotely as much as possible, provided that it doesn't result in your job performance suffering. So there's still that kind of like concern about it, but the, but you know, to consider that, you know, the largest employer in the U S decided this is a thing we should be doing. Um, is, is a, you know, a pretty obvious vote of confidence, I think. And, and, and the fact that they did it for financial reasons makes, you know, a ton of sense. It's a huge hinge that most companies are not uh, taking, right? <laughs> Yeah, okay, can, without a doubt. Can you tell me more about what you are doing in the US to to change it, to change this uh, this loneliness in adopting remote work? Because you are doing a huge job, a job that will take some time, a job that's taking a lot from <laughs> you for sure. Uh, yeah. But you are basically trying to sh to change through legis legis uh, legislation, uh, right? Uh, can you tell me more about what you are doing and how you are doing, and most important, why you are doing what you are doing? Yeah. So, so, you know, up until now, right, we've talked about a lot of the hurdles that you naturally encounter when you want to change things from a transportation or environment or socioeconomic standpoint. Um, and again, there's, as you said, there's a lot of money behind that. There's a lot of stigmas behind that. And so what I am trying to legislate is kind of an end run around all of that um, to say, okay, I, I think I've found a route that actually is difficult for people to deny, um, and, it, and it just so happens to solve all those problems. And what that is, is what I'm calling the Proof of Required Travel Act, it, conveniently the acronym is PORT. Uh, and it's kind of, you can think of it as a supplement to, um, for American listeners, it's the Title VII uh, Civil Rights Act, um, of which a, a sub element is employment discrimination. So things like the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, or, uh, or uh, acts protecting pregnant women, uh, obviously protecting race, religion, gender, things like that. Um, this is a supplement to, to those components. And what it basically says is, you know what, I'll actually just read it straight up because this is worth noting that a lot of times when you talk about legislation, people think it's like a going to be some huge document, which a lot of times it is, especially if it's, you know, intentionally <laughs> nebulous for, uh, for evil purposes, <laughs> but, but this, yes, yeah, for exactly. so. but you know, this, at least in the structure that I'm currently working on is, uh, two paragraphs. So, uh, basically what it is, is a law that says an employer may not require an employee to travel into a work site, nor may it make an employment decision such as, you know, termination or suspension due to an employee's refusal to travel into a work site, unless the employer can prove requirement of travel due to conditions that are already existing in things like the ADA um, law and things like that, which basically says that telecommuting would make you unavailable to or unable to do your job, or uh, telecommuting would be uh, an undue burden on the employer. Like for instance, if they have to spend a million dollars to get you to be able to work remotely, that's obviously impractical. Uh, and then the third thing I threw in, again, kind of just as an olive branch because I'm confident in it, is to say telecommuting Uh, results in diminished performance though in whatever way you can measure by the employee so that's that's like a huge olive branch to throw out there but basically the gist of all that says you are uh, you have the legal right uh, the civil right to telecommute anytime and all the time provided that those three things are met so provided that you can do your job uh, provided that it's not a huge burden on employers for you to do so and provided that you are still good at your job when you're doing it. And how is it being received? Uh, this, are you having good feedback, bad feedback, some things to be improved? I'm very curious uh, about how the legislators are receiving uh, this, this, the part. Yeah, it's, you know, it's funny because it's really uh, 
the more I get it out there, the more it runs the gamut of, of response. So, you know, initially there's, there's just the straight up, you know, there's, um, first of all, it's been studied that this is the number one thing people want out of their jobs that is not being provided. So, you know, take, take, you know, healthcare and salary and things like that out of it. Like the number one thing people want is to have flexibility in their work schedules and locations and things of that nature. So there's, there's naturally a lot of support for it. Um, from a, from an employee perspective to say like, Oh, this would be great if I, you know, didn't have to fight this battle individually and have companies just tell me no, because they feel like it, um, which I'm arguing is discriminatory. Um, and then you've got the other side naturally of folks who are kind of status quo kind of folks or who have these stigmas about remote workers who say, Oh, great. You know, this is some excuse for people to sit in pajamas and play video games all day, which literally says that, you know, you cannot do that basically. Well, it doesn't literally say that, but it's pretty obvious based on what's written in that very text I read that that's not the case. But so, so that's, that's where it kind of stemmed from. And then I've gotten into a lot of interesting, you know, uh, nooks and crannies where, you know, you've seen folks, I've seen folks say, I don't think this is enforceable because of the, the third component of measuring diminished performance. Um, meaning that, you know, an employer still has basically any out they want to create to be able to say you can't. But at the same time, they're saying, I don't think it's enforceable, but the fact that it would even be considered and, and you know, put out into the world to talk about is valuable enough on its own or that it's close enough to being enforceable that it makes companies rethink what they're doing or that, you know, just the nature of looking at some of the material that supports it around how um, I'm proposing that uh, it's discriminatory to not allow people to telecommute if they're capable of doing it is good for making corporations think twice about their their policies there's a there's a concept in uh civil rights known as um uh what is the thing i'm looking for there ah yes disparate impact under neutral policy i always mix those words up somewhere but um it's a it's a weird term but the idea is basically like you are probably doing this out of ignorance maybe out of malice but probably out of ignorance making a policy that treats people unequally, you know, by accident, um, in the case of, you know, telecommuting. So you take an example, like, uh, you know, Gonzalo, you go to your boss and you say, I would like to work remotely. I've got all this data, all this proof, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I believe I will be successful. And they say, that all sounds great. I, I am not telling you, you can't do it. I just have to tell you that there is a policy in our handbook that states that our physical servers must have access to the work that you're doing and your computer at all times. And you say, okay, well, that sounds like a fair, okay, I, I guess that's a roadblock I can't get over. You have to be in the office because their servers have to be managing all of the, all of the data and, and all of the IPs that are, that are being run and everything, all that nature. So, you know, you think, okay, well, there's nothing I can do about that. But then you think, oh, but wait, there's, you know, vice presidents who are sitting around in the airports using free and open Wi-Fi. There are sales executives who are in hotels or coffee shops using Wi-Fi. There's folks who are in clients' offices, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, using their Wi-Fi. Um, so, you know, like, no, that's actually not a pop. That doesn't make sense. That's not a thing that you can, that's not an argument you can support to tell me that I can't telecommute. So that's the kind of thing that I think employers need to start looking at to say like, okay, do we, like, are we legitimately not allowing telecommuting for, for valid reasons? Or do we just have some archaic way of looking at things that is going to get us in trouble at some point if people take us to court, in which case maybe we should be rethinking it now. So there's, the, so there's been interesting feedback on that front uh, from folks who are kind of, it's, it's helping their, their gears kind of start turning to think about it even from that respect. Yes, that is great. And the timing is perfect, right? Uh, remote work is in the mouth of everyone uh, from companies, institutions, ev it's everywhere. So it's spreading really, really fast. So we should definitely legislate about it. Where do you stand right now in the port and what are the next steps? Uh, what is missing for you to keep going and pushing forward to the legislate? Yeah, so there's, there's timing around legislature and you know, I've worked in many different spaces. This is kind of like the first time I've I've uh, dived into straight legislation. And so I'm learning a lot about, you know, when are the right times to talk to the right people and things of that nature. Um, but you, you start from a state legislature standpoint. So you, you want to get it passed in a state. Uh, and that particular state that I'm working on is Pennsylvania, just because I have uh, kind of the most, the, the largest network there. Um, 
but you started the state and then you hope that it builds up to a to a national level although there there are many um title seven uh protections that are only in certain states so you start there that's structurally how that begins uh which is not to say someone else couldn't pursue this in their state and i'm happy to you know there's there's nothing you know trademarked or copywritten or protected about this like if you live in Nevada or Florida or Vermont and you want to pursue this like get in touch with me I will hand you all the materials and you can start going at it um, but beyond that there's also the element of trying to approach it from the employer's standpoint and get some get some employers on board and I've talked to a few uh, somewhat large companies healthcare providers uh, tech companies trying to get them on board to say like we will support this um, either from a legislative standpoint or we will support it in spirit by making it part of our own, you know, internalizing it as our policy in the company. Because the reality is like, this does not have to get passed to be successful. You just need companies to make it part of their own, their own policy, right? So, Awareness. yeah, exactly. So like if a company says you're okay to tell a community as long as, you know, these three factors, like that can be part of a company's handbook. It doesn't need to be a law. I have, you know, I have no qualms with that. So if a company wants to start pursuing this, then, you know, it helps me and that it helps the case of, of the legislation, but it also helps companies and anyone who's, you know, wants to make arguments that like we should not make laws and it should be free market, et cetera, et cetera. Like, yeah, cool. Like this is, this is the best thing you could be doing right now, probably for your workforce. And one of the best things you could be doing for your bottom line. So do it. And maybe you won't even need to pass this thing. Maybe you'll just get, uh, you know, a critical mass of employers who are saying like, oh yeah, this makes sense. We will support this in our, in our handbooks. And then you've, you know, magically got this, uh, this sea change in how people work without having to ever pass a law. So I'm trying to pursue that as well. It also helps to pursue that from just a general awareness standpoint uh, in cities and regions, right? To say, if I want to talk to the local government, I want to be able to say, you know, I, I spoke with such and such, you know, major banking institution here and they like the idea of this and they want to pursue it. And here's how that impacts everything about how you run your city and look at all this potential we have, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, attacking it from a few from a few different angles is uh, what I'm not doing well, but what I'm doing right now. That's great. That's great. I think this is a way of doing it, actually, and we can actually change the world by doing this. And we also have cities like Tulsa offering uh, money to people who move there. So they are definitely interested in remote work. And I think this is a good opportunity for them as well. And we have many more trying to join the movement uh, in different ways and trying to attract remote workers there. Because now they know that remote workers can work anywhere. So this is money for the state. So it's also a financial opportunity for the states, right? Yeah. And that, I mean, and I tell most people I talk to what you just said, like get in while the getting's good, because it's, it's a thing that we all, it's, it's the thing that's obviously good to do that many people are not doing yet, but some folks have acknowledged. And so anyone who's acknowledged it early is, you know, speculating on it, but in a, in a way that is guaranteed to basically be successful. And so you really want to get in on it and, and do what you can now and to your point about the economic value for the cities uh and for regions right i mean it really is when you think about having talent who is in you know taxpayer base that is in your locale but is working uh on salaries that come from other parts of the world like you effectively have uh, an economic model of tourism that's the same as tourism right which is like what everyone loves to have in their city which is like money comes in from other places and then stays in your city it's you know it's it's that's a much more valuable economic model to have than one where your local employer pays you money and then you give money back to the things that go back to that employer et cetera, et cetera. you're kind of like recycling the dollars in that way the way to get you know a net benefit and a positive sum is to have money coming into your locale and then staying there from other places. So in that sense, you know, remote work operates economically a lot like uh, a, a tourism uh, state or city would operate. Do you have, how do you think actually that uh, cities and the states and the regions uh, can work properly to attract remote workers? We have a case from Tulsa, but this is all very new for them. Even Tulsa is having really good results. But do you have any ideas that we could work uh, in cities or regions to make them attract, help attract remote workers? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, it, the best thing you can do, I think, as a city is to work with local employers because you, uh, you know, you can provide infrastructure. Like you can say, you know, we've, we've you know, brought in high speed internet access that, that goes across these, this brand new developed neighborhood or whatever the case is. And that's, you know, fine. Um, but in the end, you want there to be the opportunity for people to uh, be there to work in roles that are valuable that are part of the community. Um, and you want the employers who already operate there who command a lot of the, uh, what happens as much as they aren't held responsible for it, they command a lot of the infrastructure, right? The, you know, the reason that there are highways and parking lots, and you know, I, maybe your readers don't know this, but like in many cities in America, 25% of the urban core is parking, Whoa. which is, you know, pretty, pretty crazy, right? Yes. So, like, you know, getting your employers to start thinking about that definitely means that you can start building more resilient and more interesting and, and joyful cities. Um, and so in that sense, they, I think they really go hand in hand. And cities can do great stuff as far as trying to attract folks with incentives uh, or providing better infrastructure, and they should do that. But I, I think one of the easiest things to do is really just start having these public-private partnership conversations. It do not even have to be partnerships, but just conversations to say, look, this is in everyone's best interest and we can do some really interesting stuff here. And as I went back to, you know, a lot of times, apart from the real estate being, you know, generally an asset, the liability and the expense of, of managing a, a, a large office building and paying for that expense is, you know, huge on the part of the employer. It's only going to get worse as there are people who are trying to look at those buildings that, again, as I mentioned before, maybe I didn't, um, but worth noting, like emissions from, uh, office buildings, corporate buildings um, are about two times higher per capita than what they are residentially. So they're just, they're just worse users of energy, right? And so you've got some groups, and this is a thing in New York that's trying to get passed, or maybe it did get passed, that basically says, uh, if you have a building over X amount of floors, like you're going to be taxed based on uh, carbon footprint or whatever the case may be. And so you need to make amends uh, for, you need to solve that problem or you're going to be taxed to hell and back. And so like that's increasingly a thing that companies will need to think about. And that obviously affects the cities as well, as far as the decisions they make. So to be able to say, hey, you know what, like I own or at least operate space in a 40 story building, like maybe we should change that out. So, you know, five of the stories or 10 of the stories are my employees who need to come to work every day. And the rest, you know, can be housing and that becomes a more efficient use of the space. Um, it, it turns cities that, normally people wouldn't think of as being having the accessibility of like a New York or a San Francisco into ones that do have it. Right. Cause now all of a sudden you've got a bunch of residences downtown, you've got mixed retail downtown, you've got all this good stuff. And so you can turn your downtown into a hub, which attracts um, to go back to that study you talked about way early back. Right. I think it's the same study that says that, you know, folks are moving to areas, especially millennials and the whatever generation that is behind them. Z I don't, I don't know anymore. <laughs> yeah, we, we have a lot of generations going on here. I think the new one is the C one. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, but you know that those folks, as they get into the workforce, they're moving to places where they don't need a car. They want to move to places where they have access. You saw one of the big stipulations of Amazon building its uh, HQ2 in America was they needed to be somewhere where many of their employees could use public transit to get to work. So it's a thing that's that's becoming more of a requirement to attract both residents and businesses um and so in that sense you know as you can as a government as you can work with your employers who local employers especially in the downtown area to build a more robust city uh, that does something more than throw people in a box for eight hours a day i think the more success you're going to have early on which is which is key definitely we are going towards the end and i think we you are doing an amazing work to change the way remote work is seen in the us and to make it easier for everyone both companies government and specific for people I, most of the people want to work remotely 99 percent was the last numbers uh, that said i want to work remotely so there is who is that one percent <laughs> who are those other people my guess i gotta meet those my people. guess is the managers <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. The frightened managers. Yes, the yeah. guys that don't know how to implement it and they are like finger crossing their fingers so that people don't yeah, want yeah. to work remotely in their teams because they have no way to manage them. 
Where can people find more about you and your work, Mitch? Uh, so MitchTurk.com, M-I-T-C-H-T-U-R-C-K.com is where I do all my things, which span uh, all manner of stuff. Uh, they don't make sense together, but they're there. Um, but one of the things there is Port, and you can find that there. Um, you can you can find Port on Change.org as well. It's a it's a petition there. But yeah, proof of required travel. It's also got some some press coverage if you just Google it. But uh, yeah, you can just try me on my website. Uh, you can get in touch with, with me there. Happy to talk. Again, anyone who wants to pursue this in their state, um, they should definitely do it. And I would be more than happy to help them along in pursuing that. Awesome. Thank you very much for your time. It was a big pleasure. And also knowing this uh, legal side of remote work is so, so important. And your work is so important for the US. And I believe in the future for the world. If this is approved in the US, the, the rest of the world will just follow. Uh, so yes, thank you very much for your work, Mitch. And uh, we'll speak to you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed this conversation, please leave us a review in iTunes or wherever you actually listen to this podcast and help us make a ruckus in the remote work movement. For leaving a review, you will actually help other people find out more about us, our podcast and what we want, the change you want to see in the world. Also, reach out to Mitch and support his amazing work in the US. He definitely deserves some love from you guys for his outstanding work and passion uh, for the remote work. And I'm actually starting to think about 2020, planning the next year, and guys, we are going to make a ruckus together. I'm quite excited about 2020, and I hope you come to this journey with me and join me to change the world and make remote work the new normal. Why not, all right? Thank you very much for listening. See you on the next episode of the Remote Work Movement Podcast. Bye-bye.